Alors, je suis très heureuse euh, et très honorée de présider euh, cette séance euh, consacrée à une inégalité programmée, la question de l'accession euh, des femmes aux enseignements et à la professionnalisation. Euh, et euh, je vais sans plus tarder euh, présenter euh, notre euh, collègue de l'Université de Leeds, Yéline Zhao, qui est à ma droite, et qui euh, a proposé une intervention sur le thème « Aspiration et négociation », l'artiste et modèle Victorine Meurand dans son époque et l'histoire de l'art. Un sujet euh, très orsay, style. Dans, et donc, dans cet article, elle va analyser euh, les ambitions, les aspirations de Victorine Meurand en tant qu'artiste et les moyens euh, par lesquels euh, sa carrière euh, a été euh, documentée. Yéline Zhao est actuellement postdoctorante au Centre de recherche en arts et humanités de l'Université de Leeds. Elle s'intéresse notamment aux interventions féministes dans l'histoire de l'art, la philosophie continentale, en particulier la déconstruction et le marxisme, les analyses culturelles et théories sur le modernisme. Et actuellement, elle travaille à un article qui explore une artiste dont on a déjà parlé, euh, qui est euh, donc euh, Gwen Jones et les autoportraits. Donc je lui laisse la parole pour 20 minutes, elle s'exprime euh, en anglais et je vous remercie de lui faire bon accueil. Um, good afternoon everyone and um, Again, sorry for speaking English. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sorry for my French. Um, okay, so um, I'll start with um, one of the most well-known essays in our history, that is, why have there been no great women artists? So in this groundbreaking essay, American art historian Linda Knockling acutely pointed out that it is the institutional and social preconditions such as the access to nude model and the aristocratic and later bourgeois expectation of femininity that impede women's achievement as artists. So ever since the essay's first publication in 1971, feminist art historians have mounted a considerable body of research that is dedicated to the examination of women's access to public resources in art education exhibition and documentation. Although the feminist enterprise in our history have covered virtually all periods and a substantial range of regions, in the area of the 19th century French art, this research concentrates largely, if not solely, on middle class and mostly white women. So I put up this quote from Knockling's essay. In the same way that white middle-class men are socially and politically advantaged in the history, as Knuckling reviewed here, white middle-class women have become the privileged subject in the feminists' writing of the history of the 19th century French art. As much as feminist art history has achieved in the evaluation of works and lives of women artists, as well as in the shifting of the phallocentric paradigm in our historical discourse, the ideological suppression has been retained in this marginalization of women who are not white and who are not middle class. So in this paper, I will look into the education to which women with limited financial means could have access in the 18th uh, 70s and 1880s with a detailed case study of the artistic career of Victorine Meuron, pardon my French, um, analyzing her every possible access to training and opportunity for making art, I will critically evaluate her status as an artist in the discourse. And um, reminded by um, Professor Renaud Donfer, it's a uh, brilliant work. I have to say that this paper is very much Paris-centered, exploring the opportunities available in Paris, um, not in other cities across France. So when it comes to women of working class backgrounds, it is not the case that they are entirely omitted from the history of art. 
Rather, they are often addressed under a different category as working class artisan designers, as opposed to middle class artists. This is a distinction remarked by um, Veronique Janon Burke in her chapter on the women art critics and painters in the mid 19th century France. And she also concludes that this is the result of their different art, art education. So um, it's kind of a follow up of um, Professor Renou's um, Donferd's um, paper this morning. Until the admission of women to um, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in, in 1897, the only state-funded institution that young women could enter was Ecole Nationale de Dessin pour les Jeunes Filles. Founded in 1803, the school's curriculum was designed mainly to train women in the skills for making decorative objects. In the 1870s, the state assigned administrators of the institution made it quite explicit that the state had no intention of supporting women's artistic aspirations. And I quote, we are not aiming at all in kindling in you an elevated ambition for high art, end quote. This is um, said by Louis de Honchot, the um, institu institution's administrator at the 1879 prize giving ceremony. But many students, however, rebelled against the imposed restriction and managed to exhibit their works at the salon and other exhibitions with the aspiration to, be, to become an artist. The vocational and practical skills that they have learned from the school would not be sufficient. But what other options did they have to receive art education, considering that they are often not very affluent? And more importantly, since their lives and narratives are not always visible in the history, how and where can we find these traces? I believe for these questions, Victorine Mehon might be a case in point. Best documented in the history of art as Edouard Manet's favorite model, Mehon has obtained certain visibility that allows us to track several significant moments of her model artist careers. Um, so this is one of um, her work. Born on 18th February, um, 1844, Meuron started modeling in as early as 1861 when she was 17. Between 1862 and 1873, she posed for nine of Manet's paintings, including the scandalous Dejeuner sur Lave and Olympia, which are you know, housed in this exact architecture. So sometime in the mid 1870s, Meuron started to create paintings and drawings. Her works were exhibited at the Salon of 1876, 1879, 1885, and um, 1904. In 1903, she joined the Société des Artistes Français. Um, three of her works are known to have survived. The one I just shown, which is Le Jour des Rameaux, um, Le Prix, and Jus. All three are now in the municipal collection of Colombes, a commune in the suburb of Paris where Meuron spent her last years before she died in 1927. She lived an exceptionally long life, actually. Um, to achieve the recognition that Meuron received from the Salon jury and her colleagues, and to reach the level of sophistication manifested in the painting Le Jour des Rameaux uh, requires professional art training and practice. Um, although we only have some fragmented records of her artistic career, I will try to suggest some possibilities regarding her art education based on her known biogra biographical moments, which I listed up here. The earliest possible training available to Meuron might have come from her family. Um, according to her baptism certificate, her father, Jean-Louis Atien Meuron, is a sizzler, um, sizzler which it 
means um, someone who uses chisel as his tool. Her uncle, Louis Jean Mehon, was a sculptor. Such artisan familial connection might have offered Mehon some preliminary training, yet no early records of her life has survived to verify this was the case. The only art education that Mehon acknowledged during her lifetime was with um, this artist, Etienne Le Roy. In the catalog of 1879, um, the Salon of 1879, where she exhibited, Mehon introduced herself as Le Roy's student. She might have studied very briefly in Le Roy's studio, given that Etienne Le Roy died in 1876. There are two possible reasons for this decision. On the one hand, private studios of established artists was one of the most popular forms of education for women, um, while studios for renowned artists often targeted women from the upper classes, demanding expensive tuition fees, studios of not very sought after artists, such as Le Roy, might, might be relatively affordable for, for Mehon. On the other hand, Le Roy is an artist specialized in portraits and genre paintings, and Meron might have chosen him for this specialty, as she also appeared to be interested in the subject matter indicated by the survived works, as well as the exhibition um, record at the um, Salon. In 1875 and 1876, Meron attended the evening class at Academy Julian. Founded in 1868, Academy Julian was one of the private academies where mixed gender education was implemented in the first place, but later separate studios were set up in the 1870s in response to the increasing concern regarding impropriety. As promising as the situation appeared, studios in Academy Julian were in fact classed space with considerable tuition fees. Almost double that for men, the tuition fee for women varied from 400 to 700 francs, depending on the time they wanted to spend there. The flexibility of the fees according to classroom hours expanded the studentship of the Academy Julian to women with meager means, me meager resources. For Meuron, attending only in the evening class seemed like a cost-effective strategy, not only because this was more, this, um, she could save a large amount of money, but also because she would have been able to work during the day to earn a living. Private academies like Academy Julian would invite celebrated artists to give instructions on a regular basis. For Meuron, this would also be an invaluable opportunity for her to establish contacts and connection, connections with prominent figures at a more economical cost than Com, you know, in comparison to the artist's private studios. In fact, it is likely that she made herself acquainted with Tony Robert Fleury at the Academy Julian, who later recommended her to the Société des Artistes Français. There is no record of, um, okay, I'll skip that, um, the painting. So this is another work of Meuron. Um, so there is no record of Meuron's art education after 1876, but with some basic knowledge of painting, she could have carried on practicing by just copying the masterpieces exhibited at the Louvre. We have here a print by uh, Winslow Homer capturing one of the such moments. I want to highlight that here, Louvre is also becoming a social space artists would meet each other here. In fact, um, Morisot befriended many artists at the Louvre, including Camille Corot, in whose private studio she later studied. So it is Mehon's conscious decision to join the academic system. 
Not only did she take up more conventional subject matter, she selected Le Hua, an artist established in the Salon, as her stated tutor. In fact, she exhibited at the Salon until as late as 1904, when the Salon lost its privileged power in art market. She did not even exhibit at the non juried Salon des Indépendants. What she wanted is therefore not merely visibility through these exhibitions, but also recognition from the once mainstream art world. How was Mahon received by her contemporaries as an artist? While very few reviews of her work survived, if there was ever any, apart from some comments made by Adolphe Tabahon, one of Manet's biographers, and it is not a sheer coincidence that reviews of Meuron's work came from Manet's biographer. In fact, Meuron's history as Manet's model is so prominent in the archive that almost all the fragmentary contemporary texts on Meuron that can be found in the biographies of her contemporary artists either only document the years when Meuron's life intersected with Manet's or tend to conflate her with the woman Manet depicted in his notorious Olympia. Meuron herself seemed to be willing to evoke her history for po of posing for Manet, especially when she was looking to make some financial gains. For example, in, nine, in 1883, Meuron wrote a letter to Manet's widow in which she asked for financial help and reminds the, reminded, uh, reminds the new widow of Manet's promise of a share of the income he would have um, given to Meuron if he managed to sell the paintings. According to Tabahon, sometime in the, okay, um, sometime in the late 1880s or early 1890s, Meuron made some name cards that she disseminated at, at the Café de l'Elysée. At first, according to these name cards, she introduced herself as the exhibiting artist at the Salon, but later she added this, Je suis Olympia, sujet, su, sujet de, du célèbre tableau de Monsieur Manet. So I am Olympia, the subject of the celebrated painting of Monsieur Manet. The cards were edited probably with the aim of promoting the selling of her work by borrowing this big name of uh, Manet. Does this connection with Manet bring Meuron's work any welcoming or sympathizing reception? It appears not. When um, Tabahon discusses Meuron's paintings exhibited at the salons, his tone is full of contempt and prejudice. So here, as you can see, not a single decision Meuron made regarding her artistic career escapes Tabahon's disparagement. The tutor Meuron chose, which is Etienne Le Roy, was not good enough. The subject of her paintings, um, which is you know, history and anecdotes and her self-portraits, were trivial. The paintings and drawings she submitted were bad. Her entry into the Salon in 1876 was due to the lack of discernment of the jury that year. To Tabahon, Meuron's exhibiting at the Salon marked the decreasing quality of this once prestigious institution. Even the fact that Meuron exhibited her work in the same room with Manet that year did not redeem her. While giving no details of Meuron's works to corroborate his claim that these works were actually bad, Tabahon eventually ended his review of that salon with this allusion to the rumor of Meuron engaging in prostitution. Meuron was therefore fixated as Manet's Olympia, and her artistic production was written out of the archives of our history. These contemporary writings of Meuron have made sure that she is primarily recognized by the discourse as a model rather than an artist. 
In this way, her personal history as a former model has effectively become an obstacle for her artistic aspiration. Yet, as Rosie Carr Parker pointedly pointed out in her discussion of um, Germaine, um, Germaine Greer's 1979 book, The Obstacle Race, it is not the obstacles that Germaine Greer cites that really count, but the rules of the game that demand scrutiny. The rules at play here in the case of Mahon, as um, acutely noted by Eunice Lipton, are the valorization of money and the canonicalization of the avant-garde in the art history discourse. For Mehon aspired to a career in the academic system, she is doomed to not being acknowledged in the avant-garde milieu and to be excluded from a discourse that holds the avant-garde as its pinnacle. In her feminist intervention to restore Mehon's position as an artist, Lipton reads in the writing of Mehon's contemporaries a discourse that would bar her presence, I quote, in so it's, this is a discourse that only allows a certain kind of femininity to be written into it, one that identifies femininity with passivity. For Mehon to be visible in such a discourse, her productivity and activity as an artist have to be suppressed. As part of the feminist project in our history, in 1992, Lipton published her book on Victorine Meuron entitled Alias Olympia, A Women's Search for Manet's Notorious Model and Her Own Desire. The book documents Lipton's journey of tracing every lead she could find on Meuron across various archives, libraries, and private collections in Paris and New York, and more often, these only meet, met with frustration. Most of the facts we, know, we now know of Mehon's artistic career were first published in this book. While it is researched with the diligence of an art historian, the book demonstrates a feminist freedom to use a semi-autobiographical, semi-fictional form. So the book is divided into two parts, which are intertwined and but distinguished by different fonts. So one part is autobiographical, uh, autobiographical, documenting the difficulties Lipton encountered in her personal life and the details of her research trip, while the other part is a narrative she constructed to present Meuron as an artist, based on the existing evidence as well as the documents she just discovered from her research. Although still associating Mehon closely with Olympia, Lipton proposed an alternative narrative of Mehon, in which the, women always, the woman always aspired to be an artist, but, taking, but took up modeling for various reasons. So Lipton's Mehon here would take offense at Manet attempting to draw her without her permission because she feels not being recognized as his fellow painter. This imagined Meron would model for Gonod, uh, another artist uh, that uh, Meron modeled for several times in her later years, only because she needs money. When asked about her modeling experience, Lipton's Meron also said, I, and I quote, I never saw myself as a professional model, end of quote. But Lipton is also very frank about her desire to find a feminist heroine artist in Meron as I put up here, I know I'm searching for a hero, Lipton said. What is intriguing is that in order for the artist Mehon to be restored, Lipton is compelled to suppress Mehon's modeling experience as if it could impugn her artistic identity. Like Tabahon and Mehon's contemporary writers, what Lipton has purported is an antithetical binary with model and artist on two polarized extremes. To them, Mehon can be visible as either an artist or a model, but never both. So Mehon is thus registered in the history of art as model slash artist rather than model hyphen artist. So what I would like to call for 
um, in the archive is a new methodology that allows us to recognize Mehon as fully as possible as this figure model hyphen artist. Thank you. <laughs>